Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the gracious, the dispenser of grace. The reality is this, that uh, religion over the years uh, becomes uh, transformed, uh, defines different ways of expressing itself in different communities, amongst different classes, whether it is rural or urban, whether it is uh, how it is expressed in, say, South Africa, from Indonesia and so on. And you always find variations of how this faith is expressed. <clears throat> and sometimes the changes that occurs in the expressions of religiosity, sometimes these changes occur simply in response to uh, geographical or demographic requirements. Uh, when you are living in Iceland, for example, to put a very crude example, when you're living in Iceland, challenges do arise about how do you fast uh, when the sun never sets. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, when you are living in a uh, in a country where, in say, the niqab is uh, banned, and for you it may be an important and essential part of your Islam, there are challenges in how you are going to be dealing with this now. And so, religion, whether you like it or not, uh, transforms. This is a sociological um, a sociological reality that is uh, inescapable. So, Islam at one level transforms uh, all the time, but at another level. Islam also transforms in response to demands and in response to serious, concerted uh, attempts, projects, where um, millions, billions are invested in terms of producing a particular kind of Islam. So Islam doesn't just transform on its own. Islam is also consciously being engineered. Um, <clears throat> and so the question is, and I'll come back to this, the question then is in the response to which impulses uh, does Islam reinvent itself? Does it reinvent itself in response to the demands and urgencies of the powerful? Or does it reinvent itself uh, in response to the demands of the margins. Uh, for example, I was based in the United States for about eight years, teaching there shortly after September the 11th. And uh, as a theologian, all of the questions that I was continuously confronted with and being paid to answer at universities uh, were questions relating to the demands of a wounded empire. So the empire was badly wounded after its own adventurisms uh, in uh, the world. Um, and then being wounded, their demand was to be comforted. And so I was then paid to produce lectures and to deliver on Islam as peace. Uh, talk to us about Islam as nonviolence. Uh, talk to us about Islam as moderation. Uh, talk to us about Islam and, oh, we heard that you guys are like pretty bad in your relationship with women. So talk to us about Islam and gender. Uh, talk to us about Islam and, well, I was never asked to, but uh, I can well imagine, uh, about Islam and homosexuality. So <clears throat> to, in various degrees, these were the demands of that society. And to the extent that gender and homosexuality were barometers now uh, for or presented as barometers of your civilizational value, those became key elements in the discourse of this uh, new moderate, progressive or liberal Islam. But above all, you had to speak about moderate Islam and you had to speak about Islam and nonviolence, Islam and peace. Um, and this led to kind of a very, uh, 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 the, where many Muslims would come along and say, no, 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 in order to assuage the wounds of the empire, that no, Islam is really, you know, identical to American values. Islam, we have a lot of common, you know, in fact, properly understood, uh, properly understood, uh, the message of the Quran is exactly the same as the values of the American Constitution. So on the one hand, there was this demand that Islam must be tailored to fit in with the, to assuage and 
comfort the wounds of the empire uh, on the one hand and on the other hand there was the desperation of Muslims to, to do this in order that their own location inside the empire may not be destabilized because they had, uh, they had sought refuge for different reasons, economic reasons or uh, whatever reasons, they had sought refuge in the, I'm talking about mostly the, what is called the expatriate Muslim community uh, in the global north, uh, and so they had now found comfort uh, inside here. And so <clears throat> then uh, Islam was now perceived as troublesome, and a new Islam had to be, uh, and there were traces of this inside the Islamic reform tradition from Jamaluddin Afghani and Abdu and so on long before that, but the impulse to reform Islam became now particularly uh, energized after lots of money, uh, millions of rands was thrown into this. One example of this is the Islamic prohibition on interest, the Islamic prohibition on usury. The Quran, as far as I can understand it, uh, is quite explicit about the prohibition on uh, making money on money. You can make money on the sales of goods, but you can't make money off on the trading of money. Um, and so uh, Harvard University, for example, received $35 million uh, to launch uh, a project on, uh, on Islamic uh, finance. And Islamic finance today basically means uh, the incorporation of interest into the, uh, into the, uh, into, into, or making it acceptable to the uh, Muslim imagination. And so when the needs of the powerful demand it, billions get invested in order to reshape Islam. So the first impulse of liberation theology is not the demands, uh, not the demands, neither the hunger nor the urgency of the powerful, but the, lo the search for and the location of yourself amongst the marginalized. And so this then leads to process. The process of liberation theology is one of <clears throat> locating, finding, locating yourself or your own intellectual work and your own activist on the margins of society.